Good afternoon, everyone, and great to be with you. I think I've got to turn on a microphone. Thank you for that very generous introduction, and it's wonderful to be here with you at Radford College. I join you in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and I must say it's a great privilege to be here with so many young high achievers. I have to say I'm feeling a little daunted I feel that I must have been a very late starter in life. <laughs> Ryan, there's no way I could hold a cricket bat to you. And Tiffany, it's wonderful to hear your tribute, particularly to your beautiful sister, Guyana, who's here with you. And I'd like to say a word to Guyana. You're obviously a very lucky and blessed girl to have a sister like you have but also to hear that your own sister thinks that she's so lucky and blessed to have you as a sister. So you're a great team, and we hope that you're a great family and enterprise for the time to come. And I've already met Akram at the door. He's very welcoming and extraordinarily accomplished. And though I haven't met Rachel, I've read a little about you, and I pay tribute to any young woman who is able to beat the curse that you have with anorexia and then to have the extraordinary courage to go public and to share your story with us. And I think it's a wonderful thing, particularly for young Australians, as we know it's something which affects so many young women in this country and we need more role models such as yourself. So it's great to be here in company with you all. I was up in Rockhampton in central Queensland two weeks ago. That's where my family first migrated. Central Queensland, a migrant boat called the David MacIver came in in July 1863, 153 years ago. When that boat arrived, it was only the second such migrant ship to arrive in that part of Australia. And the records show when the boat arrived, Harvey Bay was quite shallow so two of the crew went ashore and they were met by two Aboriginal people. And those two Aboriginals not only offered them hospitality, but showed them the way to the survey camp. And then that night, one Aboriginal man walked and ran 40 miles into Maribyrn to let people know that a migrant ship had arrived. And so a steamer, called the Queensland, was sent out to meet them and to bring them ashore. For me, that's a wonderful family story that our beginnings here began with a welcome. And our beginnings here began with most of us being boat people. And we know how evocative that term is in contemporary Australia. Well, I'm here with you to ask how you as young Australians, with the great privileges that you have, can overcome some of the borders and can become bridge builders for the betterment of our world. I want to start with a little story that I've often used with school groups like yourselves. Many years ago, I was up in far north Queensland. I was visiting an Aboriginal community at a place called Mantaka, near Karanda, which is now a popular tourist destination. And I visited an Aboriginal community who were visiting, who were living there on the edge of the Barren River. They were what we know as fringe dwellers. They had no title to their land, they had no permanent housing, and they were having fights with government, trying to get a better deal. At the end of a meeting, I walked out and the Aboriginal woman who convened the meeting pointed across the river and she said, see that house over there? That's Mr. Armitage's weekender. At that time, Mr. Armitage was the chairman of the Victorian Racing Club, lived in Melbourne. She said, they don't come very often, but when they come, they come by helicopter. She said, see there on the roof is a helicopter which was a new word for the traditional owners in that part of the world. That house cost twice as much as we were looking for to build basic housing for 53 Aboriginal people who were fringe dwellers in that part of Australia. 
Soon after that, I told that story in a school which probably had a similar socioeconomic background to yourselves. And when I told the story, the students asked very good questions. They were very prying questions. They were questions a bit like this. If the Aborigines want houses, why don't they build them for themselves? And if the businessman didn't pay his taxes, then there'd be no welfare payments for the Aborigines anyway, so what's the big deal? And if the white man didn't come, they wouldn't even have a water supply, so what are they complaining about? And as these questions went on, I tried to answer them, but I could see by the looks on some of the students' faces that even though I'm a flash lawyer, I wasn't satisfying them with their questions. <laughs> in fact, I wasn't getting far with many of them. So in response, I finally said to them, I can't really answer your questions, but in response to your questions, I have just one question in reply. Which side of the river are you standing on as you ask your questions? And can you see, if you move to the other side of the river, there are just as many questions you can ask, but they're very different questions, aren't they? And guess what? They're just as unanswerable. And the great challenge I want to put to you as young Australians is that you are living in a world where it's very easy to build fences. Just think of people like Mr Trump at the moment. It's much harder to build bridges. But what our world is crying out for are bridge builders. And can you see, if you build bridges, people can walk across them. And they can walk across to the other side of the river. And if they're on the other side of the river, they can then ask those different questions. And my challenge to you as young educated Australians of the future is for you to have the capacity to walk on either side of the river and have the capacity to ask those questions. You won't find all the answers, but you'll definitely be asking the right questions. Here you see a photo of a group of Aboriginal people, and I'm standing a little sheepishly off to the side. <laughs> Let me tell the story. In 2009, I was appointed by Kevin Rudd, who was then the Prime Minister, in fact, I think at that stage he was a parent of one of the students here at the school. And he asked me to chair what was called the National Human Rights Consultation. We were to travel around Australia hearing the views of Australians about whether or not human rights were adequately protected in Australia. We turned up here at Kalgoorlie. We arrived the day before and in tow with me were some bright young lawyers from the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department. And I said to them, look, from what I hear, there's going to be a coronial inquiry at the court next morning. And I think that's all anyone will be talking about <coughs> when they come for our consultation about human rights in the afternoon. So I think we should sneak down to the court, just sit in the back of the courtroom and see what's going on. Well, as you can see, I'm fairly short, and it's easy for me to sneak into the courtroom. <laughs> well, we got down there, and the entire national media were there, including ABC Four Corners. And so I'm trying to sneak into the courtroom, and you'll see an Aboriginal fellow there with a cap, holding up a sign saying, White Australia has got a black history. He called out to me, Hey, Father Frank, over here, you've got to support us mob. I looked around and thought, oh my God, that's Ben Taylor. He's hundreds of miles away from home. He shouldn't be here, and now he's causing trouble. He wanted me to come and stand with them. But I thought, if I'm involved with an Aboriginal protest, that's going to undermine my standing in terms of doing my job in running the National Human Rights Consultation. But I thought, what can I do? And so I did what I thought was the only thing I could do, 
stand as passively as possible off to the side, <laughs> but they're standing in solidarity. And it is now one of my favourite photos about advocacy. You can only be there if you're invited, and you better damn well know your place. I'm not the one who's got the beef about the injustice which is being suffered. But those who have it are there inviting people like ourselves to be there to assist and to take a stand. I've been privileged over the years to work in a variety of situations. I've had a lot to do with the people of Timor-Leste, East Timor. And I see that Kirsty Sword was here this morning, so I'm sorry to have missed her. I first went to East Timor in 1992. That was a year after the Santa Cruz massacre in Dili. It was at a time when the Indonesian power and influence over the Timorese was very strong, and it was almost impossible for outsiders to get in. Ultimately, I was able to get in as a special guest of Bishop Bellum, the Catholic Bishop of Dili. When I went and I met young Timorese people, no older than yourselves, and I saw how scared they were and how terrified they were. And I realised something about our global situation. Indonesia had taken over East Timor with Australia's blessing in 1975. It was at the end of the Vietnam War. The fear in the world at that time was about the spread of communism. And with the end of the Vietnam War, the fear of the Australian government was that East Timor could become like another Cuba in this part of the world. And so it was seen to be appropriate that Indonesia should fill the power vacuum. The realisation I came to was this. The situation which resulted in the Timorese living in fear was one which confirmed me in my peace and security. That there was a situation of what I would call interdependence. That the very situation on the globe which guaranteed me peace, security and good education guaranteed to the Timorese next door a lack of peace, a lack of security, a lack of education. Did that mean that I was guilty or responsible for it? No. But then again, if acknowledging that interdependence, I didn't do something about it, whoever would, whose responsibility was it? And so in building the bridges, another suggestion I want to put to you is to come to an understanding of your interdependence with others in the world. It's that interdependence which I think has been beautifully highlighted by Nipody in her story here today. Another insight I was privileged to get was years later, I was working in a large refugee camp in Cambodia. It was on the Thai-Cambodian border. There were over 100,000 people in the refugee camp. I'd gone there in order to do a bit of teaching, but also to be, you know, that smiling Australian face. I thought to bring people hope. One day I came in after lunch, beautiful sunny day, and I said to a Cambodian man, well, isn't it a beautiful day? Trying to cheer him up. He looked at me and he said, it's all very well for you, but I'm a Khmer, a Cambodian. It said it all. I was there as a volunteer. I was there to do good. I was there as a self-determining human being. He was there because he had no choice. He couldn't get out of the situation. And I went home and I thought that night, there's no way I can bring him hope. So why am I here? What's the point? But I came to an insight which I think is true. That if there weren't outsiders like myself there to whom he could express his hope, then there'd be nobody. And as I say, hope which is unexpressed is hope which dies. And so another challenge I want to put to you is not only acknowledging your interdependence, but standing in solidarity and being with people 
so as to build those spaces, those sacred spaces for him. And it's the challenge I put to you here in your school community now, or your workplace. What do I do to build the space for hope so that the person who is doing it tough can find a way forward? So let's conclude by just considering briefly the situation of our world today, and particularly our place in Australia. I, as an older Australian, being on a platform with all of these extraordinarily talented young Australians, have to report to you that what we're handing on to you as the new generation is not as good as what was handed on to my generation. Australia's contribution in foreign aid is now less than it's been two generations. Our generosity towards refugees and asylum seekers is less than it's been for generations. And we have only to think of the way in the last couple of days it was said that an ex-parent of this school, Kevin Rudd, could not even be considered the Secretary General of the United Nations because of the politics and because of the meanness of spirit. So we have to build a better vision. One of my favourite quotes is not an Australian, but the American, Martin Luther King. And if ever you get to Washington DC, make sure you go to the Martin Luther King Memorial, where his great sayings are there etched in wonderful stone. One of his sayings is, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. One of our very fine judges on our High Court of Australia at the moment, he once made the observation, he said, he hoped that down here in the Great South Land, that it bends a little more acutely towards justice because of our egalitarianism, because we treat everyone equally. Well, let's hope that that might be so. So, as we're blessed to live, under the Great Southern Cross, let's direct our lives so that the arc of the moral universe might bend more steeply towards justice in our part of the world. I'd like to leave you with the same question that Ryan put to you. Where can you be a little bit braver? None of us is going to change the world completely, but each of you, if you're just that little bit braver tomorrow, if you're just a little more aware of that interdependence, if you're just a little more able to build that bridge, and if you've just got a little more time to move to the other side of the river, then the world that you shape will be one which is truly in the spirit of what is contemplated here in the Durham Durham Festival. Congratulations. Thank you.